And I do want to start today with just this simple image that's on the screen. Well, it's not very simple. It's rather complex, actually. I referenced this when I was up at camp uh, on that Sunday morning sermon about the cross-references. And I just thought that my demonstration of a fountain of color wasn't really doing it justice. So this here is what I was referencing at camp, uh, where they take a line that matches the theme of the cross-reference. And the white lines and gray lines at the bottom are the chapters of the books of the Bible. And the, the colored arcs are the cross-references between those texts from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And you see the overlying arch all the way from beginning to end. And each line represents a cross-reference in the King James Bible, but I'm sure that they're all relatively close to that 64,000 count. So anyways, I thought I'd share that. And really, the primary focus of sharing that was to hide the title page. Uh, because I didn't want you guys to walk in here and see Keith doing another lesson about vessels and then get really worried that I was going to make a mess in here because I'm not. There's no ceramics anywhere around me. So we don't need to worry that I'm going to smash something because those were vessels of wrath. These are vessels of mercy. Okay? So... Today we are going to talk about Vessels of Mercy, but it's going to come from an interesting angle. In fact, you're probably going to go through the first 11 slides of this PowerPoint and be like, I thought he said Vessels of Mercy. But it will show up. And I want you to think about all the stuff that we talked about in the adult class. Mike, you did it again and again. You somehow led that parable right into God's patience, God's mercy, his loving kindness. But also we saw the severity. And... Today, we're going to talk about those things. It's hard to label sermons. It's hard to label lessons. This lesson really could be labeled marriage, according to God. But it's still labeled vessels of mercy. So I just want you to think about that as we move forward, and we will talk about it. Okay. Yes. Once again, at camp, Keith named a prophet Hosea. And we're going to spend most of our day here. I'm going to read, actually, the first three chapters of Hosea. Okay, so Hosea, I think it's important that we understand where he is in time. So with Keith, it's always a timeline. We always get a little history lesson before we start the class. So here we go. Hosea, not here in 930. In fact, we're going to start a couple hundred years before Hosea. In 930, we see that the kingdom of Israel splits. It splits in two to Jeroboam the first and Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. And this is an important date for many reasons, but amongst those, we see the kingdom split not only in politically, but religiously. Judah had the temple. They had it in Jerusalem. They were supposed to continue. Well, all of Israel was supposed to continue following Yahweh, Jehovah, right? But the northern ten tribes, because of Jeroboam's choices, right away started to veer off. And they started following gods that weren't Jehovah. In fact, by the time we get Omri's family on the throne, and that's Ahab who marries Jezebel, the Baals have pretty much taken over most of the worship in the northern ten tribes. So Israel united under David, under Solomon. Take that all the way back to Moses on Mount Sinai, where they had a marriage covenant with God. God became their husband and Israel his bride. Here, we see parts, large parts, of his bride leaving. And they're going to commit adultery, fornication with these gods, these idols of these other, uh, these other kingdoms, these other people. Down the line, we hit 762. It's probably not a number that you've heard of before. That's fine. Around 762, we have a couple major things happen. We are on to a king named, in the northern ten tribes, named Jeroboam. The second, oddly enough, not even the same family. We're way far away, okay? So Jeroboam the second in the northern ten tribes, and you have a king named Uzziah or Azariah in Judah. Neither of them are acting faithful towards Jehovah at this point in time. But what we see is, you'll hear this reference over and over again in the Bible, the great earthquake of the reign of Uzziah. If you track it down, we believe, well, I believe that this earthquake happened around 762. 
Another interesting thing is at 762, we're almost exactly 40 years before the fall of the Northern Ten Tribes. And what happens 40 years before a massive earthquake, one that gets mentioned all the way in Zechariah's writings as a correlation to the end time earthquake, but also God sends more prophets to his people. 40 years before. Amos is amongst those. He's the shepherd from Tekoa that's sent to the ten tribes to prophesy of their impending doom because of their adultery. Shortly after that, and they might have even overlapped a little bit, we have a man named Hosea. Hosea and Amos both are primarily sent to the ten tribes, but their words apply to the ten tribes and Judah. And other written prophets that are contemporary to them include Isaiah and Micah. So if you're ever wondering where those people are on the timeline, they're all in this window. They, some of them go past this window. As you see in Hosea 1.1, it says, The word of the Lord which came to Hosea the son of Biri during the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. It's a lot of kings, kings of Judah. And during the days of Jeroboam the second, the son of Joash, the king of Israel. So, what we see here is Hosea prophesied for a pretty long period of time and past 722. 722 is when the ten tribes are taken, or Samaria is taken, approximately, by Sargon II and the Assyrian kingdom. And at that time, Hosea is king. Well, why didn't it list Hosea in Hosea 1.1? 1, 1? Well, because his first primary message was to Jeroboam II to tell him, to warn him of what they were doing, what they were doing against God, their husband. So this is where Hosea sits on the timeline. You can get that information just by reading Hosea 1.1, 1, 1, but it really helps me to visualize it. it. really helps me to see it on a line, see where he sits. And I think that if you look into it, that 40 years of prophesying before 722, 722 is an important number. Because look how long God warned it, Judah before they fall to Babylon. Look how long God warned Israel as a nation from the time Jesus prophesied to 70 AD. Just look at the numbers, and it's interesting the amount of time that God gives as these windows. Okay, so now we're going to read the first three chapters of Hosea. We're not going to just read through it all in a row. I won't bore you like that. We'll go through it. We'll talk about certain aspects of it. Okay. Hosea 1, now 2 and 3. When the Lord first spoke to Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of harlotry, and have children of harlotry. For, or because, the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. So he, Hosea, went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Right here we have an object lesson being formed, and I do pity or feel bad for Hosea that it's his life that had to be part of this, but it's important for us to be able to have it and read it. So God draws up this metaphorical plan that Hosea is going to really marry this woman that was a harlot. And it's symbolic of God's relationship with Israel. Remember that God made that marriage pact with Israel after he brought them out of Egypt. And when they came out of Egypt, they had been worshiping gods that weren't Jehovah. They were already in harlotry and he pulled them out and pulled them to the side and sanctified them, made them his people, made that marriage agreement with them. Just like that, he reminds them through this action with Hosea that you're going to marry this woman that's in harlotry and you're going to have children. And we talked a little bit about that in the adult Sunday school class that the purpose was to continue teaching the children and get them to all acknowledge and turn to God, Israel's husband. So we see the analogy set in place and Hosea is living it. And the first son that's born of this marriage, we'll read about it here in four and five. And the Lord said to him, name him that son that's born Jezreel. For, or because, yet a little while, and I will punish the house of Jehu.
for the bloodshed of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Well, Jezreel, that's a place. That's a valley. That's a real place on the map. It's just north of Samaria. It's where the crossroads of the Via Maris, this road, this trade route that comes from the south comes up. It's a fertile valley, a low point in an otherwise pretty diverse topography. And Jezreel, being a fertile place, also had a lot of intense things happen. A lot of battles are fought there. Uh, it mentions Jehu here. This is where Jehu, the house of Jehu, takes over the house of Ahab. It's where we know the story of Ahab and Jezebel. And we see multiple prophecies given in this one text that God would exact vengeance on Jehu for what he'd done after the fourth generation, just so we know where we're at. Jeroboam II is the third generation of Jehu. His son Zechariah would be the fourth. And that vengeance would be taken on Jehu. But then it looks forward beyond that. And it says, I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. I believe this is looking at that 722 date. This is now them being warned that Israel will be done away with the 10 tribes as a kingdom for a time. And it says, on that day, I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. They would go to war against the Assyrians. And really, they lose to the Assyrians in the valley of Jezreel. They last two years held up in Samaria, the capital after that. But they lose their bow, their army, their force in Jezreel. Jezreel also has another meaning. First child, Jezreel. The word Jezreel means to spread. God spreads or scatters. It actually has another meaning, but we're going to talk about that one a little bit later. Because right now, God is reprimanding Israel. So everything that we see God saying is in a negative connotation. And right now he says, I'm going to spread Israel. I'm going to break their might and I'm going to spread them. Okay. I want to move forward. Hosea 1, 6, because there was three children, right? The second, the, oh, sorry. Then she conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. And the Lord said to him, name her Loruhamah. For I will no longer, or because I will no longer have compassion on the house of Israel, that I would ever forgive them. This is his bride. They've pushed him to the point that he's done having compassion. This word is interesting here because you attach the word lo in front of ruhama. Ruhama means compassion. Lo is the negative attached to the word. And I only bring this up because it's going to become important as we move forward. But God had had it with the adultery, the fornication that Israel had been doing against him, causing her people to forget who he was, who he is. So he tells him, name the daughter Lo Ruhama. I will not have compassion. Verse 7, but I will have compassion on the house of Judah and deliver them by the Lord their God, and will not deliver them through bow, sword, battle, horses, or horsemen. This is a tiny little glimpse into a, another prophecy pointed directly at Hezekiah. The Assyrian came down, he conquered the northern ten tribes in 722, and then they went after Judah. And at that time, when they knock on Judah's door, Hezekiah is king, and Hezekiah goes to God. And asks him for help. And God does not take away the Assyrian through battle, through sword, through bow. No, he does it in his own way. So I just wanted to bring to light. You can read about it on your own, but bring to light that there's little prophecies within all of this. And this one we can see be fulfilled in a miraculous way during the time of Hezekiah. Eight and nine. When she had weaned Lo Ruhama, she conceived and gave birth to a son. And the Lord said, Name him Lo Ami, for you, or because you, 
are not my people and I am not your God. We're still in the negative. See, lo is still attached to Ami. Well, Ami simply means my people. And it's amazing where you can find this word used in the text, in the Old Testament. It's usually God talking about those who choose him, those who turn to him, they are Ami. Well, here, not anymore. These people that have chosen to turn from him and commit adultery, it's lo Ami is said to them. So child number three, lo Ami, not my people. Continuing on, Hosea 1, 10 through 11. And this is interesting because God presents this information to Hosea in a couple packages. This first one feels really tight and concise. He gives him a little bit of information, expects him to pull some information out of it, and then it changes. The message is going to change here. But then we're going to read the rest through chapter 3, and we see it go into more detail. But here we go in 10 and 11. Yet the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sands of the sea which cannot be measured or numbered, and in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, it will be said to them, you are the sons of the living God. See that low removed from Ami. And the sons of Judah and the sons of Israel will be gathered together, and they will appoint for themselves one leader, and they will go up from the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. So we've removed these negative connotations. There will be, you will be my people. And then Jezreel is used in a positive light here. That's because Jezreel also means to plant. When you scatter the seed, what are you doing? You're planting. So when God chooses to scatter in a negative way, he spreads throughout the world. But when God chooses to scatter in a specific place, he plants. And great will be that day. I think it's interesting here that the number of the sons of Israel will be like the sands of the sea. We find similar language in Isaiah. Isaiah 10.22 says, For though your people, O Israel, may be like the sands of the sea, only a remnant of them will return. A destruction is determined overflowing with righteousness. Think of the kindness and the severity of God. Destruction wrapped in righteousness. That's an interesting thought. But I brought this text in as one of my only other references outside of Hosea simply to realize that to Hosea, it sounds like all of Israel will choose to turn. But Isaiah is clarifying only those who choose to turn to God will. So there's a remnant of people of Israel that will turn to God. Okay, Hosea 2 one through seven, this is directly following, say to your brothers, my people, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruhama, compassion. Contend with your mother. Contend for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. And let her, let her put away her harlotry from her face and to her... Uh, sorry, and her adultery from between her breasts. Or, or I will strip her naked and expose her as on the day when she was born. I will also make her like a wilderness, make her like a desert land and slay her with thirst. Also, I will have no compassion on her children because they are children of harlotry. For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. We're talking about God's wife. Israel as a nation. We need to remember that when we're going through this. Uh, for their mother has played the harlot. She, she who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, behold, I will hedge up her way with thorns and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She will pursue her lovers, but she will not overtake them. And she will seek them, but she will not find them. And she will say, I'll go back. I will go back to my first husband because it was better for me then than it is now. Do you see the patience in this message? God had every right 
to divorce his wife if he chose to because of what she'd done. But he doesn't seek divorcement. He seeks reconciliation. And we see that in this text. His desire is for them to turn to him. To go back and know him. For she does not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the new wine and the oil, and lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Therefore, I will take back my grain at the harvest time and new wine in its season. I will also take away my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. And then I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one will rescue her out of my hand. I will also put an end to all her gaiety, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths, and all her festal assemblies. I will destroy her vines and figs, of which she said, These are my wages, which my lovers have given me. And I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field will devour them. I will punish her for the days of the Baals when she, uh, when she used to offer sacrifices to them and adorn herself with her earrings and jewelry and follow her lovers so that she forgot me, declares the Lord. We're getting the details of the harlotry. God's wife continued to play the harlot after he married her with these gods that were giving her her wages for the harlotry. But what he, doesn't, what he points out here is, it wasn't those gods because they're nothing. They weren't giving you your wages. It was me the whole time. And then you took those wages and you continued to use them to worship these other gods, to love these other lovers. And now we need to think about the fact that Hosea's living this. He married Gomer. She was a harlot. Did she stop? No. The analogy keeps ringing through that, yes, she provided three children with Hosea, but she continued living the harlot. And at this point, she very well could have already left him for another man. Because we're going to see later that she does. And Hosea's living out this experience. Experiencing firsthand God's emotional and physical response to Israel. And he's doing that so that the people around might see it and catch on and turn back to their husband. Hosea 2, 14 through 17, therefore behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak kindly to her. Then I will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. And she will sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that you, Israel, will call me Ishi. And I will no longer be, uh, you will no longer call me Baali. For I will remove the names of the Baals from your mouth so that they will be mentioned by their names no more. Interestingly enough, in the Hebrew language, they have two words that they use commonly for husband. Ishi, there's the number for you, my husband. Baali referenced a husband as my master. And God's goal by the end of this is to wipe away any reference to the veils that he can. So he says, there's going to come a time where those who turn to me will call me my husband. What is the marriage pact to God? He created it at the beginning with man when he made woman. And they were one flesh. Do you think that God's marriage pact with Israel was any different? He took them to be his bride. To be part of him. To have this connection with him. And they continued to play the harlot. Hosea 2, 18 through 20. In that day, when they call him Ishi, 
In that day, I will also make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land, and will make them lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness and in compassion. And I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know Jehovah. If this sounds an awful lot like Isaiah, it's because it's almost the exact same wording as Isaiah 11, 6 through 9. And at the end of Isaiah 11, 9, which we quoted at camp for a meal, it says that the whole earth will be full of the knowledge of Jehovah, like the waters that cover the sea. So I reference 11, 6, Isaiah 11, 6 through 9 here. But I really, you see the word know is in green. What does it mean to know the Lord? Well, the word yada is used for know a plethora of times in the Old Testament. But when it's talking about a personal relationship with God, it goes beyond just knowing or being acquainted with somebody. It talks about a personal intimate relationship, the relationship that you desire with your spouse, the relationship you're supposed to have with that person in that relationship, that one flesh relationship. So here we get a good picture of what God expects. This is reconciliation. This is Israel, his wife, coming back to him, calling him my husband and reconciling. And what does reconciling require? It requires a betrothal of righteousness, justice, loving kindness, and compassion. She betrayed him. To what degree? She left him for all these other lovers, gave him no credit. Gomer did the same thing to Hosea. What does God want? He wants reconciliation. And if we can't see the mercy, the patience, the loving kindness in this action by God, then we're not looking hard enough because it's right there. Continuing on, Hosea 2, 21 through 23, it will come about in that day that I, Jehovah, will respond. Takes action on both parties, right? For the spouse, the, the, the cheating spouse to come back in, in Hosea's instance and in God's example here, takes action on their part to turn, to come back. And then it takes action on God's part where he responds willingly and in love. And he says, I will respond, declares the Lord. I will respond to the heavens and they will respond to the earth and the earth will respond to the grain, to the new wine and to the oil. And they will respond to Jezreel. Oh, we're back at it. We're back to the names. Jezreel. I will sow her for myself in the land. I will Jezreel plant her in the land. I will also have Ruhama compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. And I will say to those who were lo ami, not my people, ami, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God, Ishi, you are my husband, you are our God. And then they will, yada, Jehovah. Hosea 3, 1 through 5, this is the last chapter in Hosea that we're going to read. Then the Lord said to me, go again. I reference the fact that just like Israel, Gomer left. I don't know when in their marriage she left, but she left. And she was with another man. Some versions say husband, some versions say companion. So go again, love a woman who is loved by her companion, her husband, yet she's still an adulteress. She's an adulteress because she left you. She's an adulteress because she's continuing to play the harlot even as the Lord loves the sons of Israel. So go back to her, 
just like God will go back to Israel. The analogy only works if it's Gomer. Because she left, he has to take her back. Just like God, his wife left, and he will take those who turn back. Though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. We can get into the raisin cakes thing sometime. I'll, I'll, I'll help you guys with that if you want it. But we're not going to concentrate on it too much today. So I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and an omer and a half of barley. Then I said to her, you shall stay with me. This is Hosea. You shall stay with me for many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. And so, and likewise, I will be toward you. Reconciliation, these two together as husband and wife, but without the harlotry. For the sons of Israel will remain for many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, and without ephod or household idols. Afterwards, the son of Israel, sons of Israel will return. And we already read in Isaiah 10, a remnant. Just want to make sure that we remember that part. Will return and seek. Seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord. What mindset does he expect Israel to have those who return? To acknowledge him as Ishi and to his goodness in the last days. So we're looking forward towards this event. So what did we learn in Hosea? Don't worry, we're not done. What did we learn in Hosea? We learned that Israel, just like Gomer as the object lesson with Hosea, was an adulterous wife to Jehovah, her Ishi, her husband. They had one son, the first son, Jezreel, and in the negative connotation, it meant God was going to scatter Israel. And we see that in history around 722 BC to by the Assyrians. Lo Ruhama, God would no longer have any compassion on them, and he was going to scatter them. Lo Ami, you're not my people. Is that God's choice? I hope that what we've seen so far is that that's not God's choice. It's his bride's choice. It's those who chose to turn away from him that this statement is made to. Lo Ami. Then we get to this turning point in the story, right? Where all of a sudden, some of Israel will turn. And the response is God accepting them. God responding to that action. God responding to them wanting to come back to him. Because it used that word seek in there too. Remember that? So they're seeking him. They want him. He responds to that and brings them in. Then working our way backwards, he'll respond to such a great degree, more than any cheating spouse deserves. He goes above and beyond. He responds to the degree where he gives them back the land. He calls them out of the nations and he will plant them in the land. Jezreel. God will have compassion, Ruhama, on those people who turn to him. And they will be God's people, Ami. Do we see the, in this version, severity and kindness? That top row and the bottom row, all of those highlighted words, those are very real emotional and physical responses by our creator to his people. If you want to know how God feels, what he thinks emotionally, look at it. How much patience is there in the top line, set of lines? And he'll still respond. And where does it end? Israel will call God Ishi and he will be joined to them eternally. 
and they will, yada, Jehovah, they will know him. Thought question. I said this could be a lesson on marriage because it really is. It's God's version of what a, how to avoid divorcing your spouse and what reconciliation is and what it takes on both sides to do it. The adulterous spouse comes back after centuries, in this case, of committing adultery. How does God, as the husband, react? How much forgiveness does God exemplify to us? How much forgiveness should we have in our hearts in this scenario? Just think about how wronged Hosea felt. How wronged God has been. His people turned against him, and yet he will respond. Okay. Romans 9. It's not Hosea. Romans 9. Well, it actually kind of is. <laughs> Romans 9, 22 through 26. Listen to these words. What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, he's done it. He's made his power known through wrath. But what if he endured with much patience the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? They chose to turn away from him. He could have ended it right there. Okay, you don't want me? You're out. And he does. He has. But what if sometimes, quite often I find, what if he endured with patience these vessels of wrath? But why? Oh, 23. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon the vessels of mercy. So by having patience with all of Israel as his bride, it shows more glory when the people who actually choose him come out from among them. And he prepared these vessels of mercy beforehand for that glory. And then Paul says, even us, whom he also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. Thank God. As he says also in Hosea, I told you we weren't done with Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, lo ami, my people, ami. And, and, to, sorry, and her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be, in that, be that in that place where it was said to them, Lo ami, there they shall be called the sons of the living God. Who was Hosea sent to? Israel. Israel and Judah heard his message. So Paul isn't necessarily changing the definition, right? He's not taking Hosea's writing and, and shifting it to the Gentiles. Because the Jews are God's bride. Israel is God's bride. But if God is willing to have patience on those vessels, the ones that committed harlotry against him, then what will he do for those of the Gentiles that turn to him? So it's not that he's rewriting the prophecy and who it's to in this text. He's using it to show God's love, to show God's loving kindness towards all of his vessels of mercy. And I thank God every day that we have the opportunity to be counted among those vessels. But it takes work. It takes maintenance. So let's maintain. Let's remain vessels of mercy so that we can partake in that glory. Let's have a song.
Okay, let's close with song number 297. We shall know. 297. Let's stand, please. God and Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you for your love, the love that you have shown us by giving us this life, this opportunity to turn away from the natural man and seek you and find you. And we pray, Lord, that you would allow us to continue to walk in your paths that you have provided for us and that you would guide and direct those walks each and every day. We ask that you would allow us to take what we hear here today and apply it to our lives and meditate upon it consistently. We pray for those who could not or would not be here today, that you would strengthen them and, and guide them back to your fold if they have fallen away. We pray, Lord, that you would forgive us for the times that we fall short of your will and that you would allow us to have a place in your kingdom. These things we ask if they be thy will. In Jesus' name, amen.